Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Uh, my name is Bruce Lowry and I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team and I'm excited to welcome you to the Skoll World Forum session. Are you ready to help prevent the next pandemic? This year, the forum's theme is closing the distance and we thought there was no better way to reflect that theme than to invite our global network to design and build a new kind of event together. And this session is emblematic of that approach. I wanna share a few quick items before we begin. Um, this session is being recorded and we will release it publicly after the event. Please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other and use the Q&A feature to send questions for the speakers. Uh, this is a 60 minute session. Uh, we will have a poll at the end of it. So we hope you will take that. And on social media, we are using the hashtag SkullWF and we would love for you to do the same. Uh, we're really thrilled to be able to include this session in this year's virtual Skull World Forum, and we want to extend a special thanks to Ending Pandemics for proposing and designing it. And with that, I invite you to enjoy and engage with the session. Outbreaks happen every day around the world. The challenge is preventing any one of them from becoming the next pandemic. Speed matters to stop a spark from becoming a raging fire. We need eyes and ears everywhere to quickly identify and report unusual events in humans, animals, and the environment. This approach is called participatory surveillance. Communities are actively stepping up to become part of the solution. In Cambodia, people are reporting health events in real time through a free national hotline. In Thailand and Tanzania, local health workers are finding outbreaks in animals before any spread to humans. And in Brazil, this approach was used for the first time during mass gatherings. Everyone has a role to play in stopping a threat anywhere from becoming a threat everywhere. Expanding participatory surveillance across the globe will keep us all safe from the next yet unknown threat. Help us empower all communities to stop pandemics before they start. Greetings to friends and colleagues across the globe who are joining us at the 2021 Virtual Skull World Forum. I'm Dr. Mark Smolinski, President of Ending Pandemics. I'll start off by asking each of you in cyberspace, are you ready to help prevent the next pandemic? This session is all about democratizing our ability to find and contain outbreaks faster. So whether participatory surveillance is something totally new to you, or whether you're an avid supporter of this direct form of engagement, we're excited to have you join us today to hear from the pioneers of this approach who have created the systems highlighted in the introduction video and more. Participatory surveillance is the bi-directional process of receiving and transmitting data for action through direct engagement of the target population. In all the systems supported by ending pandemics, partnership with the government is a key requirement for success, as ultimately it is the responsibility of the government for monitoring the health of the population. Without government ownership or buy-in, data is often just data. Through government partnership, Data can translate into timely, trusted information essential for rapid action by those in charge. And as we all know by now, speed matters. We created Flu Near You in 2011, a participatory surveillance system to track seasonal flu in the United States in partnership with HealthMap and the American Public Health Association. 
For over a decade now, Flu Near You continues to demonstrate the power of self-reported data from an informed public and is serving as a model for developing other participatory surveillance systems. It is this two-way open channel of communication between the public and its health authorities that are allowing communities across the globe to stop outbreaks dead in their tracks. So let's hear now from some of these innovators joining live from Cambodia, Thailand, Tanzania, South Africa, Brazil, and the United States. We begin with a two minute video of each system followed by a rapid exchange for five minutes before moving on to the next system, hence the lightning talks label for this session. As audience members, you can contribute questions at any time in the Q&A tab and we reserve time at the end of the hour to answer as many questions as we can. So buckle in and get ready for a rapid trip around the globe, starting first in the place I call my second home, Cambodia. Introducing the 115 National Hotline. Roll the first video, please. <laughs> ដាក់ចំណៃដល់មាន់ជ្រុកពេលនោះខ្ញុំក៏បានទៅទះឃើញមាន់របស់ខ្ញុំនឹងពីវិកបាលងួរកុសផ្លែកពីធម្មតាគ
the key in here is like the, the goal was to the hotline was to detect uh, the outbreak signal in the community. That was the goal when we setting up uh, with them uh, with the Ministry of Health at that time, and we did not anticipate um, to come across something like COVID at this time. It was originally it was like we're looking at like H five N one and in general the detection of the outbreak in the community, and um, with the uh, preparedness in advance and uh, of this hotline and when COVID hit uh, it was uh, immediately Cambodia was already uh, prepared itself so um, the hotline has served uh, uh, in a full strength of supporting the public during the COVID yeah excellent and can you um, help the audience understand how this national hotline is um, accessible and free to everyone in Cambodia? Yes, thank you, Mark. So the hotline uh, was designed uh, based on the interactive voice response and um, it's uh, accessible uh, uh, by all the population in Cambodia by even with the basic phone, they don't need to have a smartphone. And uh, we, uh, the hotline is a, is a toll free line and it's a, a, a work with all the mobile operator in Cambodia. So basically any, anywhere that have the mobile coverage in Cambodia is accessible. And it's local language, importantly. Um, so that means that even those like uh, illiterate uh, people that cannot read and write, as long as they can speak, they can talk, they can participate it, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the text, the outbreak signal, in uh, reporting the cases, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the challenge um, at, at the event of the EpiHack, which I'll mention uh, in a moment. But uh, it really was the direction from the ministry for at that time the 14 million people who lived in Cambodia to all be able to access that. It was exciting to see the various tools, including the voice command for, you know, simple phones and especially with the large uh, literacy rate uh, in Cambodia, it didn't matter. People could still interact and leave messages and so forth. So I know that that hotline uh, had been in operating for several years and receiving up to 600 phone calls a day and 20 to 30 of those were often human or animal health issues that were being reported. This form of participatory surveillance that really, you know, is one of the few that is nationwide and getting a lot of uh, information, especially my understanding is that it scaled, you know, to, to 18,000 calls a day during COVID. But has it helped bring the human and the animal uh, sectors together and looking at, you know, information from both uh, risks coming through a, a single device? And can you speak to maybe the power of this uh, data to really also bring sectors together. Indeed, Mark. Um, so with the information that the community reporting, for example, like we're talking about zoonotic disease, like we have the case that in 2017, where the farmer uh, report about the uh, abnormality, like the video presenting uh, in uh, uh, the, that of the chicken. So basically, the community participating the information that data reporting from the community it it encouraged more of the uh, both human and animal have to pay attention and look closely and work together to respond to that because this is not just a report from the officer it's a report from the voice from the community um yeah excellent well thank you Chane. you heard the magical music was just telling us our time has come uh to an end but of Clearly, we have questions already flowing in about the hotline, and we'll have a chance to interact again during the Q&A session. So thank you very much. And with that, um, you're, you've talked about uh, breaking down silos, and uh, now we can move next door to an overview video of the system in Thailand that's taking a One Health approach, uniting both human and animal surveillance by design. So let's roll that video, please.
ในบ้านได้รู้จักคําว่าสมาร์ทโฟนก็เป็นอย่างที่น่าภูมิใจพอดีดีอินไทยมีนลุกคลอสลีแอนด์ยูเอลซีอิสสิบล่าจุดโฟมแอนสตาแกรมวิทเอาแอนิฟิลเดอร์สที่เฮลป์เดอะโฟลเลนเทียร์สในเดอะวิลเลจทูสับมิทอับนอร์มัลเฮลป์อีเวนต์ในเรียลไทม์ค t อ e ่าคือคุณจึงเป็นคนที่ต้องเตือนผู้ป่วยที่มีอาการติดเชื้อได้รับการรักษาและดูแลให้ดีที่สุดเพื่อไม่ให้เกิดการติดเชื้อระดับโลกและที่สำคัญคือการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคนด้วยการเตือนทุกคน Good to see both of you, um, Jack. I still can't believe that we first met almost 10 years ago when you were merely a student uh, and <laughs> yes. our faculty. Uh, and Toy, it's been great to see how your career has advanced alongside the PodDD tool. So thank mm -hmm. you both uh, at this late hour for joining us uh, uh, to share some further insight. So um, the. PodDD pilot was in 2014, and it really is exciting to see that it's providing evidence that participatory surveillance, you know, may be one of the most cost-effective and efficient ways to save lives and livelihoods by orders of magnitude. And it's really great to see that uh, the system is helping us understand that. So let me just first start with Toy, um, because this tool we understand. Really is being used by volunteers like the grandmother uh -huh. that we saw in the video, who it was wonderful to meet a few years ago. Um, yeah. Can you help us understand the challenges of training volunteers in the village and how you overcame those challenges? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Um, back to the back to 2014 when the Paw DD project started in Chiang Mai, Thailand. At that time, most of the smartphone user were teenagers or young adult, while majority of the PDD volunteers were like um, seniors or elderly people with the educational level of under bachelor degree. So, it is the one of the challenge. One of the challenge was accessibility to smartphone, internet, and technology. That was limited in the rural area in Thailand. So we decided to we decided the p o d d application to be flexible and to be friendly to use. It comes with the online and offline function, and the data the data input the data input by letting the volunteers to focus on only one. On only one thing at a time on their screen, uh -huh. and during during the training, we found that the young girls help and encourage the elders whenever they struggle with the technology, as well as the monitoring and evaluation are a b e r n e d e d And we also learned that. Multiple level approach and communication were important to harmonize the community working. And mm -hmm, yes, <laughs> yeah, no, that's terrific. And I know there's so much pride among the volunteers mm -hmm. when you get to meet them in person, and it's really exciting to see. So on the other mm -hmm. end, the volunteers are helping you know to uh, look for zoonotic diseases, since we know three out of four diseases jump from animals to humans. But Jack, we often hear, you know, skeptics of participatory surveillance say that 
uh, you know, why would there be an incentive to report if in the end it just means you're going to come and kill off all my chickens or my livestock? Um, are you finding that's true of the farmers in Thailand or how have you managed that potential uh, risk of this kind of tool uh, in the community? Oh, uh, yes, of course. It's uh, many problems when we implement the PODD. Not only large scale culling that we face, but also the conflict within the community and livestock authorities. At the early stage of PODD implementation, the livestock authority, especially in the district area, did not agree with PODD and they didn't want to use the PODD application in that area. They were afraid that PODD was the burden before the implementation, they try to control the outbreak by themselves. If they cannot control, they will report to the higher level or the shift. But once PODD was used or was implement, implemented, every level knows together immediately af after volunteer reported. District authorities need to take an action. They cannot cover the outbreak within their area and try to solve the problem at that uh, by themselves. Why in the co community, many volunteers don't want to report the case if it occurred in that neighbor house. When the officer come to those neighbor's house and the neighbors didn't realize what happened, they will doubt the volunteer near them first, the volunteer report. So the volunteer don't want to be suspicious. Of course, we overcome those barriers by including district authorities to be a part of PODD team and find a process to help their work not to be their burden. And for community, we encourage the whole community manipulate by themselves. When the officers come to the community, they need to contact with the leaders of community first and then work together. Moreover, PODD team had to keep privacy of data and volunteer solid authorized people can access the data that's that, that we work well we're getting short on time but just a quick uh, response from um, both of you uh, uh, what is one key exciting unexpected outcome or one key lesson in 20 seconds or less uh, that you've learned from PODD toy yes okay <laughs> mark um one thing one thing that I found during I work in the PODD, as Jake said, one of the unexpected impact was the volunteers report interference from the some authorities. As Jake said, uh -huh. in some cases, the authority don't want the volunteer to report via the PODD application due to it will be documented or it could be a cause of the community panic or, or the notification will send to their chef. Mm -hmm. So the authorities, some of the authorities mm -hmm, yeah. interfered and asked the volunteer to avoid, to avoid using the PODD application in relevant events such as the forest fire, are the abnormal sick and dead animals and so on. Yeah. So yeah. I think that to cope with this issue, the understanding and the communi communication among the stakeholders, especially for the government, for the government agency are very important. Mm -hmm. Great. And Jack, we could come back to you in the Q and A. You can think of your one thing, and um, and we'll ask you then, unless you have a quick response. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you both, and we'll see you again in uh, shortly. Um, yes. We, you heard uh, Chane mention an Epi hack. The PODD tool was also created uh, through an Epi hack, which is a process that we created at any pandemics that brings both human and animal epidemiologists together uh, for a week with partners from the government and academic centers and local developers and as much of private sector partners as we can bring in as well um, to really co-develop tools uh, that are then used to find and respond to outbreaks faster. 
And we often bring a participant from a future EpiHack uh, to a current EpiHack so that they can see one being done in another country before they host one. And the, um, this next video is the outcome of an EpiHack in Arusha, the host of which were participants at the EpiHack in Chiang Mai. Please roll the video. If we needed any reminding, the Ebola virus epidemic in West Africa and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic have emphasized that national and global health security hinge on our ability to detect disease early at source. Zoologically, that is potentially zoonotic diseases in animals before infection of people and geographically, that is at community level. As Africa bears probably the highest burden of infectious diseases against the background of a limited resource base, it is important that our strategy for early detection to trigger early response be One Health and community-based. The Sackets Foundation for One Health has pioneered Afia Data as an open-source digital disease surveillance tool that eases the collection, analysis, documentation, and feedback of public and animal health events from community to national level, targeting public and animal health and the environment. Afia Data allows trained community members in remote areas to transmit health information to local surveillance systems. Information is then verified through testing and then acted upon. The tool can be customized based on different clients' needs, including language, surveillance, and data integration needs. For the first time, I introduced Afia Data to our it's very important because we use it to inform other people about different diseases which are mostly notifiable diseases from animal to the human being. For example, anthrax, tuberculosis, TB. Early detection at community level leads to national and global health security. Well, welcome, Ezran and Professor Mark. Uh, we, that's our distinguishing uh, uh, way to address each other since Professor Mark and I have known each other for many, many years and have had the privilege of really helping them see the creation of the regional network in South Africa or in Southern Africa, um, which is part of an organization that uh, we now host internally as a program called CORD. So it's great to see you, Mark and Ezran. You've been instrumental in many tools that we've worked together on uh, in the region, but this is exciting to see where Afia data has come. And um, so maybe we'll jump right in and, and now that people have seen the video, um, I'm sure they're curious why you chose first to work with the Maasai community. So explain the relevance of that group as sort of your first target population and how it fits into you know, your overall vision for One Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mark S. Um, actually, we chose to work with the Maasai community because of their actually uh, way they live with the animals, both should be livestock and the wild animals. We started working in Ngorongoro, which is a, a unique ecosystem cohabited by the Maasai on, uh, from the human side and also the domestic animals, but also interacting with the wild animals without an offense. So for us, because SASID is one health, uh, as one health focus, uh, that is actually the relevant entry point because when you enter through you know, animal, the passion and the mass I have the animal, you can also identify the public health issues. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I know that um, this tool has really changed health seeking behavior uh, in Tanzania and various communities that you've worked about. So um, can you help us uh, understand more about how this tool really is leading to different uh, health-seeking behaviors as a result? 
Yes, the AFIA data and the design of participatory surveillance actually allowed us to introduce this card which operates between community and the official system. We call them the community health reporters. And we, this is equivalent to community health workers in public health, but us, because the same person identifies and also reports the event from both human and domestic and wild animals. So we designated them the community health reporters. So we the, actually, because these are the unique people selected within the community, they're known to the community. So by virtue of having them from the community, then they are trusted and therefore we, with time, actually, when people are used to the after that community, they, report, they become very trustful of the community as the report of the, the tool. Therefore, reporting the more events, and also we have the referral system where the community health reporter connects the event identifying the community to the official system, therefore making the referral system uh, very uh, important and trusted by the people who would otherwise not be willing to report to the no more official system. Yes, yes, no, that's terrific. Let me just jump over to Professor Mark. Um, and ask you a, a larger question about, you know, since we know that you uh, run the regional network there in Southern Africa and, and understand that pathogens don't stop at geographical borders. So how has like the creation of AFIA data and your thoughts of, you know, participatory surveillance, um, you know, how could a tool like this or how is it helping uh, with cross-border surveillance? Has it opened any doors to conversations or partnerships with neighboring countries? Well, it is not such uh, opening barriers uh, professionally. When we formed uh, SACIDS in 2008, uh, we took trouble in the first year workshop where we conceived this to have um, equal representation from the public health sector and the animal health sector. Uh, and that has enabled us to, 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 to cross barriers. You know, one example is uh, during the COVID, and, and here I need to pay tribute to um, Skoll Foundation for having um, helped us to, to react early. Um, that we found governments were already appreciating the, the concept of um, national uh, capability. Uh, for example, in, in Zambia, we had the capability in the veterinary laboratories where they had a level three and the diagnostic capabilities. So while the public health laboratory was um, the one responsible for diagnosis, um, the actual work was being done in the background by um, uh, our veterinary laboratories. Um, in Tanzania, we trained uh, the, the public health laboratories, but the sequencing, um, and then backstopping all these people was also be done by the veteran side. Uh, and then the cross-border um, element, uh, at the beginning, uh, Ezra was then on the committee, National Committee for Surveillance. We talked about events surveillance. And so then they said, um, it's quite early, way back February, the biggest area uh, gap we have will be this cross-border. So we've designed, um, starting from a veterinary background, designing for the public health laboratory, uh, so the public health service, um, point of entry scheme with their uh, programmers and their own people. We're now backstopping them, we're training them, they're rolling, rolling that out. And in fact, I got some money from, I think it was um, uh, USCDC to, um, to do some of this uh, training. And we're hoping now we can have um, more done with the East Africa network so that we can extend that. Great. No, thank you so much. And just one quick question back to you, Ezran. Um, how has the AFIA data or the participatory surveillance um, improved timeliness uh, in disease reporting or response? Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, I mean, we have uh, some examples both in 
humans and animals where the events that would have otherwise been missed uh, captured through the system. First of all, the participatory surveillance is linked to the district uh, level uh, reporting system, which reports to the national authority and also uh, the veterinary side. And therefore, this application of uh, AFIA data can, has a proved to improve the timeliness uh, in reporting events in both human and uh, animal health sectors. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And we'll see you again in the Q&A, which is coming up very shortly. Um, so again, thank you, Ezra and Professor Mark. So moving from Tanzania to their neighbor next door to the south, uh, we're excited to share an example of participatory surveillance being incorporated into the Health Connect tool in South Africa. Uh, please roll that video. Hi, my name is Christoph Preikelt, and I'm from Preikelt.org, a technology nonprofit working in South Africa to improve health. I'd like to talk to you about Health Alert. It's a system that we developed together with the Department of Health in South Africa to combat the spread of COVID-19 during the pandemic. In March 2020, we were in a very unique situation in South Africa, knowing that we had almost 100% mobile penetration and also having worked with the department in developing MomConnect, which now reached more than a million people via mobile devices. We realized there was an opportunity to communicate and set up a system to rapidly disseminate the information that government felt every person should need in order to respond to the pandemic. In a few short weeks, less than two, we collated the information with the department and were able to launch a WhatsApp-based informational service supplemented with USSD and SMS. We had a national campaign on television and during the lockdown announcement from the president, were able to get millions of people to sign up to get personalized information and to be able to ask questions of the system as well. Our goals were threefold. Firstly, we wanted to make sure that we had a trusted, secure and real-time information portal that could be updated on a daily basis. Secondly, we wanted to build a self-diagnosis tool so people could test their symptoms to know whether or not to get tested, especially during the early days to not overburden our physical health infrastructure. Finally, we wanted to take that information and be able to upload that to our national data infrastructure to be able to build predictive models for our Department of Health in able to, to enable them to predict the future spread of the disease. The system had unprecedented success in terms of a national rollout. More than 10 million people have now access to the system, which is almost 25% of our population. On top of that, we've sent almost half a billion messages in the five national languages of South Africa. We also believe during the rollout of the vaccine, we now have a system that we can communicate on an individual basis with every single person that's communicated to us in the past. And in future, we believe that this will be the bedrock and the foundation of a truly inclusive national health communication platform. Thank you. Well, welcome, Gustav, and I believe you have Chuck. Uh, it's great to have you both, um, and thank you for that uh, updated video. Uh, Chuck, I remember when uh, you called me early in the pandemic um, to learn more about Flu Near You, which we then created a sister tool with Health Map called COVID Near You. And at the time you had this idea that, you know, Prake Health in South Africa could think about participatory surveillance. So I'm just wondering if you could take us back to your early thinking at that time and, and where you sit today regarding uh, this active approach towards community-based surveillance. Um, uh, Mark, thanks so much. And thanks uh, to Skoll for organizing this. Um, I should say at the top, I think if, if we get this right, if we get participatory surveillance right, we have the potential um, to save lives um, in, in the form of preventing future pandemics that's on a similar scale of um, impact to the investments we're making in, um, uh, in all the other infectious diseases that, that we're working on. Um, as you know, I, I sort of wear two hats. One is with the Goldsmith Foundation, where we've worked in alignment with Skoll on it with a number of uh, relationships and with Living Goods, where I'm the founder and chair. And um, through both of these vehicles, um, 
you know, we're a strong believer in, in digital strategies that both empower community-based health workers um, and empower patients um, uh, with simple digital tools to make it easier for them as this break help tool does uh, to self-educate, to self-assess, um, um, uh, 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 to find their optimum path in the health system and to, and to do a better job of self-care. And uh, when COVID hit, um, you know, uh, we do so much work in community health workers, you know, one tends to lean to the thing one knows best, but it became quickly clear to me that community health workers alone weren't going to be, we weren't gonna be able to train or empower them quickly enough to detect uh, COVID. And so the kind of platform that, that uh, Prekelt has um, uh, seemed to be a, a powerful opportunity to reach people at scale. And, and Goldsmith was an early funder in the, uh, the development of Prekelt's turn uh, uh, platform. Um, uh, and what's in, inspired us about this was how quickly this has gotten to scale. Um, and so really my, um, uh, my question for, for Gustav is how did you do it? Um, what is it, you know, I, in two parts, what is it about the tool itself, um, the patient-centric nature of the tool itself and the simplicity of the tool that enabled this uh, uh, scope? And, and then secondly, what's it about the nature of your partnership with the government, um, the trusting relationship, how you use the government to promote this that got you uh, such broad coverage so quickly? Please, over to you, Gusto. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. Um, as Chuck said, I think uh, we've we've kind of been inspired by this idea of using consumer <clears throat> technology to connect, to go directly to the patient and to support them, uh, not just only in the technology that they that they already have, but also in the kind of modalities that they're used to interacting and always supporting them directly um, and offering the kind of information in real time. Uh, in a way that they're used to connecting with each other, you know, to to connect with with their friends and their loved ones. And so, when um, the on the technology side, uh, we we chose to work with consumer. You know, what does everybody use? A mobile phone and specifically chat um, uh, and WhatsApp. So we we used WhatsApp to build a bot uh, to communicate with a, a really large number of people really quickly. Um, but I think the key is, as, as Chuck said, is that at, we provide it in a way that they were very comfortable in doing it. Um, and it goes to show that um, now, now, not only do we have a bot, but we have an opt-in rate of, of more than 60%. We reached 25% of, of South African adults, almost 50% of household, households in a, in, a, in a couple of months. Um, but technology is only one part of it. The, the, the other one is obviously you can't get to the scale without, and I think a lot of people here have said that, uh, without government support. And, and we were really lucky that we already had a partnership uh, through the Mom Connect program uh, that we ran with the Department of Health um, that we've been running for the last couple of years. And then that we could work together in a very, I mean, we literally built the system in two weeks, getting all the information, getting it on a WhatsApp platform, um, and then having the, the endorsement from the Minister of Health, uh, from the President, um, really promoting this national hotline everywhere. Um, to get, I mean, I think we had within the first weekend a couple of million views on the on the platform already, um, and I think that was really the key is to have that endorsement. Um, I shouldn't forget, obviously, the carriers as well, the, the network operators promoting that number, um, and and being able to so combine that that idea of, of of consumer technology direct to the patients with with this deep endorsement was was really key. I think. Great, terrific. Well. We better take that cue because I know people are, the questions are starting to flood in. So um, thank you, Chuck and Gustav for that overview and we'll see you in just a minute. Um, and so now we're gonna transition to the question and answer portion with the audience, but I do wanna lead off with a question to our final uh, guest speaker from Brazil, um, because I would be uh, uh, remiss in not talking about an effort where quite frankly was something we hadn't expected when we first started working on participatory surveillance. And this was a request that came from the Ministry of Health in Brazil saying, have you ever used this technology for a mass gathering? And they were uh, contacting us in February of 2016 and they had in mind the World Cup that summer. And so uh, as you can tell from the other systems that um, you've heard about, uh, that we've worked with partners on the ground, the key is to have local talent uh, 
combined with the government buy-in. And so we were fortunate enough to meet Onicio, uh, who was just starting up EpiTrack at that time. Uh, and they not only helped with the World Cup, but again, it was used during the Olympics two years later. And uh, the tool itself is being used by various partners within Brazil. But Onicio, um, in starting off the q and I'm going to ask you a question that probably lots of people have in their minds right now, as they've heard about these various systems, and you've been involved in, in one or two yourself. How do you see this approach of participatory surveillance really being applied to the pandemic or to future pandemics or something that like, you know, in the big bird's eye view, uh, help the audience understand this approach and, you know, how it's being used or where it could be used or just your thoughts, considering we're all sitting in a pandemic right now. Hi, Mark. Thanks. Um, yeah. So. It, it was very important in Brazil, we started passport surveillance back in 2014 or 2016, because that helped a lot during the, the beginning of COVID pandemic, when the pandemic started hitting Brazil, several health secretaries there were aware about the benefits of passport surveillance, and many of them adopted that in order to have this tool helping fight the pandemic. More specifically, there is a really important case that I'd like to mention. In a city in the northeast part of Brazil, the health secretary was trying to optimize the coronavirus tests in order to make them more efficient, um, since there was a partial limitation of distribution of it. And they accepted to combine data from participatory surveillance and from traditional health surveillance, enabling an innovative approach for identification of clusters of risk areas. Within those risk areas, they were able to prepare test tracks going at communities and deploying the, the tasks and people from that risk areas previously identified. And this strategy increased in more than 80, 88% the capacity of identification, helping them to make non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, at community level. Mm, great. Oh, thank you for sharing that. It's a great example. So with that, I do need to turn over the Q&A period session to Nomita Divi, our director at Any Pandemics. Uh, and she's been monitoring the input uh, so far uh, for the virtual audience. So Nomita, with that, I turn it over to you for the Q&A. With the reminder, we must go back to Jack uh, for his response to the question. I didn't give him a chance to answer. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Mark, and noted. And hello, everyone. I'm happy to see questions coming in in the Q&A channel. And in the limited time we have, I am going to try and ask as many questions as we can get through. Uh, note, following the session today, we will share with you a summary of the event that will include answers to select questions we could not get to. So without further delay, the first question will go to Chane. And as you come up right next to me here, this question is about replicability. Chane. How replicable is the 115 hotline? And if a country is looking to replicate this approach, what might be an initial step? And um, are there any anticipated challenges you wanna highlight based on your experience either in Cambodia or with replication in other countries? Thank you, Nomita. Uh, so uh, 115 hotline will uh, use the free and open source software called the boys. So, um, so it's, um, in terms of like replica replicability, this is uh, an advantage because of the, it's a free and open source software. And uh, one of the, uh, the, to replicate that from our experience uh, that implementing this in Cambodia successful so far is um, one of the most critical important point is to secure the uh, local championship in the country. Like in our case for um, the hotline in Cambodia, the Department of the Communicable Disease Control of the Ministry of Health Cambodia is the champion and the leader in here in uh, in, 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 in uh, supporting uh, and, and, and enabling it uh, uh, for the rollout and usage uh, as well. Uh, so there's a drive inside uh, from the champion inside the Ministry of Health. So uh, replicatable of it, I think this is one of the most critical points about all the technology is to have the champion in the country, especially the ministries itself. Uh, and on for the hotline, uh, the toll free is one of the very important part of it 
to secure the, the, the toll free of the hotline so that it's accessible by everywhere, by everyone in the country, no matter, uh, or, uh, no matter what the economic is. Um, because it's a public health is a health for all. So it affects all, so it's toll free is a very necessary for the hotline. And to roll it out uh, for in, in any country, uh, uh, choosing the local tech partner that can actually work, uh, experience working with the mobile telecom in the countries and experience in working with the ministry as well as the key partners is a, is a really uh, uh, necessary in here. And then also not just a focus on the technology itself, you know, the co-design of the content and flow. And, and here again, what we do is like co-design with the champion in the countries and testing and testing, validating until we're making sure that this is ready to roll out. This is a very critical. Um, yep, uh, we did a little bit uh, small like, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, is it no matter <laughs> concerning about the time? Yeah, that's uh, great, Sunny. No, thank you very much. Um, did you have any exposure with other countries or initial talks with other countries with, with your ex 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 experience with the 115 hotline? <laughs> Yes, so 115 hotline was, was strong, mainly will focus uh, in Cambodia um, uh, to make it sure that success in works and so on. And we did a small pilot also in Vietnam in a similar model approach, but in a, a small scale pilot to test to see whether it's possible to do it. Yes, indeed, it, it actually showed that possibility. And we recently also talked with uh, some folks in um, Kerala as well about the possibility of replication there. Yeah. Great, thank you. And, I will drop a link in, uh, to learn more for those who want to learn more about 115. There's a case study uh, by Digital Principles on 115. I will post the link uh, in the chat. Thank you, Chenna, and thanks for providing that clarity. Um, I'll direct the next question to Jack, and I'll start by asking you, Jack, about your observation of unexpected impacts in CODD. Very short answer. Did uh, I have positive impact? That is for policy. We co collaborate with many organizations, especially the, from the, the government organization. Uh, for example, we just uh, combine the air pollution monitoring with the health promotion center under Ministry of Health with PODD and report the air pollution monitoring scale to the people in Chiang Mai. Yeah, that is uh, the, the impact from me. Thank you, Jack. And I'll also ask you, you know, in the video we hear Kang talk about everyone being able to be a disease detective with the right incentives. That's a really yes. important point that he raises. And so based on your experience with CODD, what have you observed to be the most effective incentives in helping people uh, or attracting people to use the tool? I think reputation is the most one, not the money. The first two years that we have implemented uh, Party Day in Chiang Mai, we provide the money and telephone, that smartphone for them, but for the volunteer, but it's not a, a sustainable way. But after that, we try to make the reputation, especially in community to the volunteer. And then they are willing to report, willing to join us. And we also try to make them like a trainer for the other volunteer in the future. This is a video. Excellent, thanks, Jack. And I'll direct the next question to Gustav. Yeah. Great. Gustav, we've heard Toy and Jack talk about some of these unexpected impacts. Uh, on their systems. And, you know, Jack just talked about the environmental pollution being an unexpected interaction with stakeholders. Can you speak to any unexpected learnings or impacts you've observed thus far? Mm. Um, I mean, I think the, the first one for us was um, really the, the incredible speed with which the systems can spread organically uh, within a population. Um, so the, the moment, I think in the past, we, we had systems and you promoted them um, and it would take quite a while and you had a 
kind of organic, slow kind of growth uh, in how these things work. But because of the consumerization of, of media more generally, and, and I know people focus a lot on the, on the negative aspects uh, thereof, but I think for us, the thing that really blew us away is, is literally within the first couple of days, we, we, we had over a million users um, uh, on the systems. And I think the positive side of, of uh, these types of systems is that people are linked organically within groups, uh, person to person. And if you provide a patient centric, user centric service that people really value, then it'll spread organically. And that's really incredible power um, to provide not only um, information, but a, a, a way to, to launch these services. And, and, and we've just been really um, blown away by, by how effect, effective it can be with, with uh, if you provide the right information. And so um, has this tool been um, used in the vaccination registration as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We, the, um, we, we originally built it mostly for information purposes, um, uh, but obviously what are people asking for most right now is how do I get vaccinated? Where do I get vaccinated? And so we're very uh, uh, happy to be, to be building out the, the, the universal uh, registration platform and supporting the government therein um, and also supporting some other governments. Um, and uh, I think that's that's going to be really unique, being able to provide a, a zero cost universal system for for anybody to be able to to register via via chat. That's really fantastic. Thanks, Gustav. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Ezron. The next question um, is, you know, Gustav has shared how his tool has scaled during a pandemic. And um, I, my question to you, Ezron, is can you share how your tool may have scaled in the past during outbreaks? Uh, thank you very much. Actually, in the past, Afia data was used to support the cholera control program in Tanzania between 2017 and 2018. But uh, also recalling the current COVID pandemic, uh, even, even us now, we deploying the system across the border. We're going to Mozambique in next week to deploy FIA data, uh, uh, yes, across the border, so which is very, very useful. But also we have interesting experience where AFIA data also was used to track outbreak of rabies in remote areas reported by community uh, workers. We have several cases where AFIA data has been so helpful in actually supporting this outbreak in human and also in animals. Thank you. Thanks, Azran. All right, uh, Onisio, I'll direct the next question to you. As a tech entrepreneur, I would imagine that you did not plan to be working in the public health sector. And so how has engaging in the public health sector either changed your mindset or approach? Yeah, by the way, before I, I become a tech entrepreneur, I, w I used to work with uh, in the public health sector. So I understood uh, very well their problems, their challenges, and being an entrepreneur, I was able to identify the opportunities to improve the way that they are, they are doing public health or how innovative tools could help them to, to boost the impact of public health. And this was one interesting advantage to, to, to be in the, the, the both sides of the table. That's great, Onisio. Thanks for that clarity. Chane, I'm gonna bring you back on screen here. And my question to you is, what resources are required to receive, screen, verify, and act on all of these calls? It's, you know, there's clearly several steps and several stakeholders. Can you highlight, and you did allude to this a little bit in your past answer, but can you highlight really key stakeholders and partners to, to have a successful hotline? Um, so um, uh, the hotline sort of from the initial uh, point of it, um, the, from the discovery point of it is uh, we supported from the, we got the support from the ending uh, pandemic, which is previously called a school global threat fund. And, uh, and uh, in here from in terms of resources also to verify and it, um, the Ministry of Health, I'm sorry if I miss anything, if uh, a folk from the Ministry of Health can help to correct it. And here is, um, there is uh, a number of organizations that supporting the Ministry of Health Cambodia. Uh, there is like WHO, uh, US CDCs and so on. So the resources is, uh, in the hotline, 
the hotline basically whatever the process they have before before the hotline is verifying and so on it's already in place there so the hotline is coming to get in getting more information closer from the community and run the same through process as what it is before and uh, lately also with the, uh, the ending pandemic support on the uh, verification as well on starting the uh, and, uh, uh, supporting the on the uh, the uh, verification fund to the Ministry of Health. So this is something that to um, uh, will be, I think, will be help uh, greatly to Cambodia in the future. Like this is an in initial step that if, if we can see that with a small uh, fund that can help verify it even faster, it can help stop the catastrophe from uh, scale bigger by de uh, delaying the time. Absolutely. So you alluded to timeliness as well, which is a very key point in all of these systems, as well as something Jack. Uh, talked about, you know, getting the key stakeholders involved really helps with, you know, building that not only timeliness, but reputation, which really, you know, carries one uh, very far in terms of uptake. So uh, we heard the chime. And so that will conclude the Q&A session. But before we conclude the session today, I want to share with you the upcoming fourth international workshop on participatory surveillance, also known as IWOPS. The gathering is planned in March of next year, and we're hopeful. Uh, if you enjoyed the session today and would like to learn more about this event, please go to our website at endingpandemics.org and click on that IWOPS banner to sign up and receive updates on this meeting. Also, if you know of other participatory surveillance systems around the globe, we want to hear from you. So please visit our website and share this information. Now, I welcome back Mark to conclude the session. Oh, thank you, Nomita. And um, a big sincere thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today uh, to share your stories and bring both light and life to participatory surveillance. Thank you to the Skoll Foundation for providing this platform to get our message out to the virtual audience. And remember, you really can help prevent the next pandemic so join, support, or create a participatory surveillance system near you. So enjoy this final day of the Skull World Forum. And again, thank you for joining this session. Bye.